This meeting is being okay, I'm starting to record now. All right, so we're just going to start this up. Um, hopefully I'm recording this. Um, okay, so I have gotten some really good questions over the last couple days, and I've jotted them down. And I just wanted to go through them because I thought they were pretty helpful for everybody uh, to know. Um, the first question that I thought was super great came from um, several IT folks. Um, the, the jargon that I used in some of the videos around um, IT software evidently wasn't helpful to some of the IT people. Um, there are terms out there called SaaS, which is software as a service. There is um, PaaS, which is platform as a service, and IaaS, which is infrastructure as a service. And these are really the technical names. So, and I've um, I've uh, got this on a video that I went and tweaked called Gatsby Next Steps on our website. Um, and I went and added that on the video, but for accounting people, what you guys need to do when you approach your IT staff, you need to be asking your IT staff for these three things. So it's SAAS, PAAS, and IAAS, software agreements. And if there's any IT people on the line, if you guys want to pop in and add to this. I think Walt Oliver could 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 chime in at this. Hey, I'm sorry, Catherine. I had another message come in. Uh, <laughs> what what <laughs> what's the actual question? Sorry um, about that. That's okay. <laughs> when we were talking uh, the other day about um, making sure that accounting staff, when they come to the IT department, they're using correct jargon so that you know what to pull. Um, so software as a service infrastructure as a service and platform as a ser platform as a service um, because what a Sabita is is it is temporary use of software it is not software that is permanently loaded onto your computer so um, if you think back in the old days when you got a CD a CD-ROM I hope I'm using the right terminology and they loaded it on your computer it is not that it is something that is just temporary access. So the terms that accounting staff need to use when you talk to your IT department is software as a service, which is SAAS, um, infrastructure as a service, IAAS, and PAAS, platform as a service. Is this correct, Walt? It is, but the accounting people are probably not going to know the difference between each of those terms. Um, the, the umbrella term of cloud-based whatever whether it's software or services, that should be their starting point. Starting point, And then the IT people can describe it in, in probably a whole lot more detail than they want, uh, given a chance. Okay, so I hope that helps you guys, um, because if you, if you ask your IT people for software, you might end up with, with software that is not a Sabita. It might be permanently loaded software, um, but, but again, you need to make sure the difference between a Sabita and, per and permanent um, software, which is not a Sabita, you might end up getting things that you don't need to look at at all. So that's the first question that I got that I've been getting that was super, um, that I wanted to make sure that everybody gets clarified. The second question that I wanted to start is when to start your lease. Um, I had a video that we loaded up last week and I thought, um, of course, you know, if I'm creating my video, I think they're all just amazing. Um, but I did a complete example where we loaded from start, we started with a contract from start to finish. And the question was, when do we start the date of our software subscription? Okay, can y'all see anything now? Yes, Catherine, it's up. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so right here, I've, I've done in the video, um, I've done, it's called, I think, example of a contract from- I just sent it to you. 
Okay, good. Um, from start to, it's basically from start to finish. Um, I put in on the um, implementation file, the, the, the date of implementation actually is start, it starts July 1st, 2022 for um, GASB 96. But this, this contract, which I've named the software subscription ID submitted example one, the contract started on um, February 1st, 2022. So I'm going to start it on February 1st, 2022, even though uh, Sabita 90, uh, excuse me, GASB 96 doesn't take effect till July 1st, uh, 2022. I hope that makes sense. So start your capitalization when the contract starts. And um, on our payment schedule, when we go to our payment schedule right here, we'll just pick up the payment schedule right here. So when you start your amortization on July 1st of 2022, this is what your amortization would be. So the, the monthly payment on this, um, this particular contract was 12,280. So this is what your, your payment would be. You would split it between principal and interest. So that was the second question I got is when do you, um, put in your payment date. I hope that is somewhat helpful. I, I think to clarify on that, Catherine, if you want to go back to the master data schedule, yeah. um, the date you're putting there should be the date that it begins, the software subscription begins. Um, but what will actually capitalize into the system, I believe will be July 1st, 2022. Um, and the amount that we will capitalize is the amount that is remaining on that lease as of July 1st, 2022. This Excel file calculates that for you. Um, it calculates that value. Um, but when you're entering, entering in your payment schedules, what we need to do is we need to capture the full amount um, for that payment schedule for the full term. And then what we, what this Excel file does is it sh uh, it shaves off everything that occurred before 7-1-2022 and then records everything that occurs after. Because anything that records before that's on this lease will have been recorded as just as an expenditure on your books, everything like that. What we're trying to do here is just merely capture everything that has to do with that. Correct. So to, 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 to put into, a, uh, give you an example of exactly what he's saying, in this master data, it gives you the asset value of $376,000 for this um, Sabita. If I go back to the payment schedules, that asset value is starts at 7-1 and goes here. And if you see right here, do you see that 376.073? Denise, you can't see it? Okay. It's not showing the bottom section. Okay, of it's not showing. Okay. So if I sum total the principal amount starting at July 1st, 2022, and go all the way to the end of that Sabita life, which it ends on um, January 1st of 2025, that principal amount sum totals to um, here. Oh, I've got it locked. Um, it's so that that principal amount, excuse me, the asset value is only totaling starting at July 1st, 2022. So that asset value isn't considering this value right here, if that makes any sense. Okay, so that's what, to, that's the practical effect of what James just said, is just because you put in right here, 2-1, 2022, it's not gonna take into effect that principal amount for those four months of, uh, of amortization. Okay, so that's the second question we got. So go ahead and don't be afraid to set up your lease, your lease calculator, the date the lease starts. Um, the third question we got is who takes care of the lease and the roles? Um, so with the Sabita process, it's a little different because we with GASB 87, you involved your accounting staff and your procurement managers. With GASB 96, you're involving your IT staff and your accounting managers. Um, for the agencies, please do not push this off entirely onto your IT staff. This, you, all you need to be getting from your IT staff is 
the software information. But once you get your software information, you don't need to be relying on your IT staff to help set up the terms of the Sabita. You just need to be getting that from your IT, IT staff. And then once you get that, get that information, then your IT staff needs to exit the process. Because the last thing you need to do is rely on your IT staff to set up the capitalization. And then you end up with a bunch of journal entries. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, end up with a bunch of having to change all the asset values, which could lead to um, a lot of unnecessary scrutiny from auditors, which could then lead to some write-ups for you at year end. So um, don't, don't put them in that position. Okay. Um, the other question that we've been getting is uh, people have been calling and saying, um, well, I have this Sabita, but it's not on the list of suggested um, submit a list of software accounts that you, or general ledger accounts or software vendors that you suggested. Um, is this okay? That list that we suggested is just a starting point. We know 100% that that doesn't contain everything, but it's just a starting point for you. Um, so that's all I got so far. I'm going to open the floor to any questions y'all have. And James, if you wouldn't mind answering the questions, because I'm yeah, quite done. Yeah, I see a few on the side um, okay. in the comments. We'll start with those. So uh, first question I see is, is there a dollar amount threshold? Um, there more than likely will be. The issue with that is that we have to figure out what we have in the state before we can determine what that is. And so the goal is for us to get everything we can, regardless of dollar amount, from y'all. Um, and once we get all that in from all the different agencies, we will analyze it and figure out what um, can be called de minimis. Um, and at that point, only things that are over that de minimis threshold will actually get capitalized and we'll have that amount going forward. Um, but at implementation, we first need to know what exists and what's out there before we can say what dollar amount will be um, that threshold. So we don't know it yet, but there, there will be. Um, but before we can get there, we need to have a full inventory. James, this is Patrick Jarvis. Um, so like with uh, GASB 87, um, it went by the, if I'm not mistaken, the, the thresholds for like a low value asset. So anything under $5,000 didn't have to be uh, capitalized. Right. Is it, at least that going to be um, in place for this? Uh, I can't say for sure yet. I, I would imagine more than likely, but once again, we, we want to get a full inventory first just so we know what's out there and what we are um, taking off the table. And that's simply because this has never been capitalized before. You know what I mean? With, with assets, we at least know what is out there and what has been capitalized and that, that threshold is established. Um, this would be an entirely new threshold for software expenditures, that kind of thing. Because um, as you know, the, the current threshold for intangible assets is $100,000. Um, I can't imagine this threshold will be that low, but we, we, we just want to get a good inventory and a good, good idea for our perspective as well, um, just to know what's out there. Um, and at the end of the day, the auditor is going to want to look at everything anyway um, as they go through it to see to make sure we didn't miss anything during this process. Awesome. Thanks. Um, and also the skis team, they're going to do the initial uh, asset setup and all that, correct? I believe so. That, uh, Catherine can confirm. But the, the plan is uh, not for you all to key these manually. We will do the same process as we did with 87. Um, where there'll be a mass upload with, with their assistance. Um, Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. so um, it, this process is going to be, sorry, just, if, if y'all can see my screen again, um, this process is going to be exactly like GASB 87, where you did the asset setup. Um, and if you look on my screen right here, you can see the master data. Then you're going to, we're going to first, we're, um, that master data, once you fill it out completely, it should, it should flow into the two tabs right here, this create asset tab and this abs on tab, which are set up to be loaded into skis. So, um, the, it should be creating the upload in skis for you. 
And I believe with the GASB 87 process, it was a mixture of some agencies. Once they got the go ahead from us, um, they worked with skis themselves to upload it or the, um, the um, Comptroller General's office did it for them. Uh, I wasn't part of that process, so I can't say for sure, but I, I can confirm, you know, whether or not we uploaded. And y'all can, y'all might be, y'all probably are more knowledgeable on this than I am. So um, you guys can probably say whether or not Kelly uploaded for y'all or y'all uploaded it yourself, but I believe it was a mixture. Uh, this is Barry Lloyd. I'm IT director at Mental Health. Uh, just I have a question because you, it's called software-based IT. So, I mean, subscription-based IT, but uh, you mentioned cloud-based stuff, but there's a lot of things that are locally installed, but are subscription-based, like our Microsoft licenses. We install Office on the PCs, but it is a subscription-based, but they're installed here. It's not cloud-based. Is that considered a Sabita or, or, you know, Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it, it is not cloud specific. It is anything that is subscription based that is software technology. Um, so cloud based often falls under that just because cloud based is usually subscription, but anything that is locally installed as well would also qualify um, as long as it is a subscription uh, that is paid for under contract for more than a year. So if, if it's a contract that falls mm -hmm. under a year length, then then it does get uh, carved out. But anything that's over a year, that's a subscription and is software uh, meets those initial criteria for Sabitas. Did I not read somewhere though that the Microsoft Office products like Excel and Word were excluded? That For that example, Microsoft Office, Office and Word, um, there's two different types. You might pay a subscription for it or you might also have a license and it'd be a perpetual license. So 20 years ago or so, what they would do is you'd buy a license for a computer, you'd get that, you'd get um, Office 98 and you'd have that license perpetually. Uh, you wouldn't have to have to pay it again. Um, in that case, that's a perpetual license. Perpetual licenses do not qualify for Sabitas. It's the only thing they're looking at is if it's subscription-based. If it's uh, you pay for it, you own it for a limited amount of time, you are leasing the software. Um, but once that lease term is over, you no longer have access to that software. That is what they're trying to capture with Gatsby 96. Um, so that, that was the example we used for, for Office was if it's a perpetual license that you purchased. That's so funny that, um, who, who was the one that piped up and said that? Denise, of course. Denise, I thought that was Denise. <laughs> um, so that's so funny that you said that because when I put that example in there of Excel, I was thinking of, we had just gotten um, back some, some agencies from GAS, for GASB 87 where we had put in formulas for XLOOKUP and some agencies still had an old version of Microsoft um, Excel that they couldn't handle an X lookup because they still were using, they had old versions and so they could only handle a V lookup. So I was, when I put that um, example in there, I was thinking of agencies who hadn't, who maybe were having, they had such old versions of Microsoft Excel, they were those old versions that they loaded on that just stayed around forever and ever and ever. Um, and so that was what I was thinking of when I was giving that example. And James walked in here and he goes, Agencies are going to, they're going to confuse that because there's two different types of Microsoft now. And, and so I, that's hilarious that you, Denise, um, pointed that out because um, James and I kind of had an argument about that. So I hope that, does that, Denise, do you under, does, does that make a difference for you? Do you understand the difference between a perpetual license and software as a subscription? Excellent. Yes. Okay, good. Um, we'll keep moving down our uh, comments list questions. Um, I had the question about a lease calculator on our website, um, where it is located. Catherine, can you do you know where that is on our website? If you could show that, um, just so um, we know where it is. You know, Carla Lindler asked for one yesterday, and I'm wondering if it's not on there anymore. I thought it was, but um, regardless, the lease calculator that was up there was. It had references to GASB 87 language, and I believe the year-end date on it was for 2021. So I just 
um, have one, um, I've just rolled one forward that has language for both 87 and 87 and 96, and it has a year and date of 6-30-2023. I will get that posted to our website today. And I can also, if you want, just for ease, um, send it out to all of our contacts um, after the end of this program. That would be great, Catherine, because I think if too many of us bombard the website, we're going to have a problem there too. Yeah, that's fine. No, I'll be happy to send it out to everybody. And uh, we had a question uh, from C Spires uh, about a contract symmetry example. Could you elaborate on that just so we can make sure I'm, I'm answering your question? Hi, yes, this is Carla. Um, some of the subscriptions that we report um, are similar to Catherine's example that she had posted in the video. Thank you for that, that was very helpful. Um, but we have included those types in our miscellaneous loss and commitments closing package. So I'm wondering, do we remove that from there and only report it as GASB 96 so it's not doubling the liability? Or how does that work? Wow. Um, so you have your, your, <laughs> your recording Okay, say that again. You're recording some of your similar to the contract in your example. Yes. We would have we would have recorded that in our commitment closing package because we have signed an agreement for multiple years and we're incurring a liability for that. Yes, it 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 would not go in there anymore. Correct. Okay. So if 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 that amount ends up getting capitalized uh, as part of GASB 96 those would be that would be on your books because of the capitalization and in that case we would not need it reported um on that mis miscellaneous loss closing package yes yeah the goal for that closing package is to capture stuff that's not in skis yet um so so there's one less thing you have to do <laughs> Okay, um, what about software that's been prepaid? Uh, for instance, we just prepaid for a three-year license for software. Um, my understanding of that is those situations, we would need to capture them. Um, they would be an asset that you would, be, you would have, we'd have to amortize those um, over the time period. Um, as far as ones that are already prepaid before 7-1, that you have a subscription outside of that, um, we'll have to get back to you. If y'all wouldn't mind recording that and making a note of that in the implementation files, um, that is a very specific circumstance we'll have to discuss internally because um, there's some complexities to that. Because as, as you know, they, they will not have a further liability to be paid, but they are an asset that is that should be depreciated over that time period. Um, so, um, I think Christina Jordan, you had that question, but if you have any software that's prepaid, that has already been prepaid, but the subscription term last past 7-1-2022 for a year, um, please do include those in your implementation file and put it put in the notes file, just a question mark or anything like that, the notes column, and we'll take a look at them and, and we'll discuss with you in detail. Um, Could y'all elaborate, uh, Department of Commerce, you had a question on, should there be accrued interest if the 2-1-22 commencement date isn't taken into account? Could you elaborate on that question? Yes, um, my name is Joyce Strader calling, I mean, I'm sorry, from Department of Commerce. And uh, Catherine, you mentioned when you clicked on the uh, payment schedule, if you can do that here in Excel, it showed interest for um, that first uh, 7 one 22. Uh huh. And for GASB 87, I was given the instruction that if for the first payment, there wouldn't be interest. 
It depends on um, if you have your payment at the start, if the payment goes at the start of the um, schedule or at the end. And I believe oh, okay. this one is at the start. If, if I'm, I would have to go to my lease calculator, mm -hmm. um, but if it goes at the start, um, it, it pays on day one. So there's not enough time to accrue interest. Okay. I but see. if it was at the end, you would have had 30 days to accrue interest. Okay. So that interest amount doesn't depend on the commencement date, but when we make our payments. Yes. So okay. um, this one, I believe the payment date started on two, two, one. Mm -hmm. And um, which, and then I, I believe it was at the start, but it does, it does, the, the interest it does change whether on the very first payment, whether or not it, it begins at the start or the, or the end. Okay. And I actually do want to say one thing, which I've um, repeated multiple times, but just to drive home, we, we had this problem with GASB 87, where <laughs> when people were calculating their payment um, on the lease calculator, they did not include uh, taxes. So um, you just want to make sure that whatever the bill is going to come in as, sometimes the, sometimes the bill comes with, with taxes and sometimes it doesn't. In this example, um, if you watch the video, uh, I, I talk about it. In this example, the, it's because it started back in February, which I, you can see right here on, it started back in February. I actually had an invoice, which I didn't show the invoice because the agency, this is, this is a real um, Sabita from a real agency, but the agency did not want me to um, reveal you know, who it was. And, and there was also some confidentiality clauses in the contract. So we had to do a lot of um, redacting on the contract. But I, when I pulled the invoice for the um, contract, there was no taxes imputed on the invoice. So I was able to verify that this agency was truly paying $12,280. But there will be some in instances the, that even though the contract specifies $12,280, the bill you receive might include taxes on top of it. So um, just make sure whatever you're capitalizing is going to equal what the invoice is going to equal. Does that make sense? Because we had with GASB 87, a lot of times where they set the asset up, but when the bill came in, it actually didn't equal what the, the payment was set up to be. So um, agencies, because it was just their first rodeo, didn't know what to do with the taxes. So they stuck it in their principal or they stuck it in their interest. And then they ended up having to go back and do a journal entry and then ended up having to go over here I hope I don't, this doesn't make y'all sick because this would make me sick. Um, where you had your, this right here, it would come in as your asset value per skis. They would have to go and then do, I think what an abs on and adjust the asset value per skis all because they didn't quite get the taxes built into the capitalization. So just make sure you're getting, you're capturing what the asset value is truly going to be. And it agrees to the um, value. Yes, Denise. Go ahead and finish, and then you can get me. I'm done. Oh, I was just going to say, so the payment date on the left-hand side, as we make all of us sick, um, is that the payment date or the invoice date? Because, you know, your invoice date may be February the 1st, but the treasurer's office isn't releasing payment until February 22nd if your vendor's default payment terms are net 3022. So is the payment date a little farther to the left? actually supposed to be your invoice date column l yeah um so the way i set this up um i i would pull if i pull the contract um the contract in the video if you if you guys don't mind giving me just a second to pull it um they had a schedule in the contract and it it's it had you know pay in this month um i hope there are no bad words in here my gut reaction to that question is is yes it would be the invoice date it would be the date that y'all are tracking internally for due dates yes um 
it, 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 we're not worried about what day it actually goes out the door no. as much as what the doc date posting date is going to be on the JE yep. and, the, and the in skis. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. But Catherine, Catherine, you can confirm based on what we Yeah. Say. Yes. It's, it's, it's based on the contract date. Um, and then what you do. So right here, this was, this is the contract that the, um, that the implementation, you know, what the Excel sheet that you were looking at before is based off of. So you can see right here, it's February 1st, 2022 to January 31st, 2023. And Sorry to stop you. Sorry to stop you, but we're only seeing your Excel spreadsheet, which may be what we need to do since this Say is that again. But anyway, just wanted you to know that we're only seeing your Excel spreadsheet. Oh, gosh. Which, but, but you may not. It's possible you're not supposed to show us that contract. Oh, no, no. So. This, 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 this <laughs> contract is um, what is up on the video. So let me go see what I'm sharing. Okay. Okay. Um, here. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So um, this contract right here, this is the actual contract. And it's in this, this contract is in the video and I think the video is great because what I do in the video is I take this contract and I walk through and I talk about all the terms in the contract that are exciting to me now that GASME 96 is what I uh, sleep, breathe, and eat, it feels like. Um, so it might be worthwhile for you guys to look at, but in this contract, it lays out the terms. And so based off of this, you can't see me, but I'm pointing at right here. It says February 1st, 2022 to January 1st, 31st, 2023. And it's got the 12,280. And that's where I got for the payment schedule, the 12,280. Um, now, in that video, I also talk about variable cost versus fixed cost. Is everybody clear on variable cost versus fixed cost? Catherine, one thing, uh, based on what you're showing now, this is Patrick, uh, yeah. by the way. Um, it doesn't say whether the payment's due at the beginning of the month or the end of, month, end of the month or anything. It just tells you when the, it when the service begins. Right. If, if you see right here, it says... Um, it says during the period set forth below. So I made the decision and this is kind of where it's going to just come up to being a, an accounting professional and you just having to make your gut reaction. I just made the decision to set it up at, as payment due at the start of the month. Yeah, so I, I, what, to answer y'all's question, I, th I think what we, you would need to record for a date would be the date y'all plan to actually book it. So if y'all plan to make that payment as of the first of the month, regardless of how long it takes for it to get out the door um, based on payment processing. If y'all book the entry on doc date the first, that would be the date you use. If you plan on paying at the end of the month, that would be the day you use. It should just be consistent with what y'all's y'all's budgeting and plans are. Um, it's going to take a while for these contracts to catch up with what Sabita 96 actually specifies. Like Sabita 96 specifies how, using an interest rate I can guarantee you none of these contracts are going to have an interest rate laid out in this. So that, that's going to bring up another point about um, interest rates. Um, you're going to need to use the bank prime rate. And we, we give you that bank prime rate in the, which I'm going to pull this up again. I need to make sure I give you that screen. Y'all seeing this again? Y'all seeing this uh, Excel sheet? Yeah. Okay, so I, I, I referenced the bank prime rate in the implementation file. As of April of 2022, it's 3.5%. That rate is going to change, okay? And I show you, I give you a screenshot of where I got it from. So it came from the Federal Reserve, and there it is right there. But when you all set up your assets going forward, you need to check what that bank prime rate is at the time you set your asset up. So... So Catherine, Patrick again, sorry, I'm the, no, I'm the, go, the go for it. That's what it's the for. dumb question guy. Um, so is this uh, going to be standard across uh, private and public accounting? Um, and that question, um, will, will, 
will the vendors cater start catering to our needs? Will they? Because I remember when Gasb eighty seven went live and Presidio was like the first contract after that. When I was at the treasurer's office, within that uh, contract agreement, they provided a <coughs> amortization schedule with with everything built in. So will this be like, will it be standard from here out that whenever we sign a contract that is a Sabita, that the uh, vendors will kind of front load all of this information into it? Probably not. Could could we make a, could we get with MMO and make that a requirement in some of our uh, uh, procurement activities? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, the, to my knowledge, this is purely a Gatsby. Um, as you'll probably know, Gatsby is trying to get closer and closer to the business world. Um, I do not know the full motivation behind this um, 96. So it, it could be that it is trying to get closer to um, FASB. It could be that it's uh, something they, they cooked up themselves. Um, but it, it is a, a Gatsby pronouncement. So it is just true for government, to my knowledge. Um, this thank you. Up, sorry, Patrick, go ahead. Just saying thank you. Okay. Um, I actually wanted to, uh, I don't know why, Patrick, your, your question brought this up, but um, it brought up in my mind another question that I've been asked a lot about service contracts built into software agreements. A lot of times um, you'll, you'll have like maintenance agreements associated with software agreements. And the question I get is why um, aren't service contracts um, considered Sabitas? And the best reason I can tell you why a, a service contract is not considered a Sabita, and James, correct me if you're wrong, is I believe it just comes down to accounting theory that services are not considered assets. And um, that yeah. is as ivory tower and asinine as it can get. That's my theory on it. James, what do you think? Yeah, in, in Gatsby 96, if you, re, if you read through it, there's a, there's a section that talks about what costs when it comes to software implementation get capitalized versus what get expensed. And it talks about there's three stages that's, that it sets up. The, stage, the first stage is the stage where you're searching for a specific software. You're, you, you're trying to figure out what your needs are. You're trying to figure out what uh, company would give you the best product. Um, there's the second stage, which is implementation. That's where you're actually putting the software into your system. You've already figured out what software you're going to use. You're trying to make it compatible. You're trying to load it, all that. Um, and then there's a third stage, which is ongoing maintenance um, and upkeep. Um, what Gatsby 96 says is that second stage, the implementation phase, is the only stage that gets capitalized. The stage beforehand, when you're searching for a product, that gets expensed. The ongoing maintenance, so when you think of um, the service agreements, I think those would fall under the third category, the third phase, and that's probably why um, they're not capitalizing them. Um, one other thing, training costs um, don't get capitalized either. So any cost you might have to train employees on how to use a new software, those get expensed as well. Um, what we're really looking to capture is the subscription payments itself, and then anything that might have to do with implementing it um, into the system. So if you have any big software that required big implementation costs, that kind of thing, um, I would recommend reading through 96 in detail to help with that. Um, I will say as well, um, this implementation is happening as of 7-1-2022. That's the amount that we're actually gonna capitalize and capture is any liability, any subscription payments, anything that's left as of 7-1-22 going forward. So if you have software that's already been implemented beforehand and you're just paying for it going forward, the only thing we're gonna capture is going to be the payments that are remaining. Um, that's kind of why I had the question earlier about prepaid payments, prepaid software. We've got to figure that out internally, um, if that makes sense. James, you're so awesome. But it helps for me to understand the whys of, of this. And so, um, again, when you're looking at it, just remember, it goes to accounting theory. Accounting theory says a service is not an asset. 
So just remember that when you look at a contract and think uh, maintenance agreements, support agreements is a service. And just remember that is not considered an asset. So um, just think of it that way. Um, I'm going to keep going through some of our questions in the comment section. Um, I've got three over here that I'm going to answer kind of as one group. Um, can you provide examples of software that is and is not a Civita as well? If we do not place a con, if we do not have a contract in place, but it is likely that software be renewed, do we have to create schedules for this? And then does the fact that we antip anticipate renewing the annual license every year have an impact on this process? Or does the fact that we enter only into seven, into 12 month agreements exclude those subscriptions? Um, so examples of what is and is not, um, can't really give you examples of specific software, just because any software that is subscription-based could be a Sabita. There's a lot of criteria for it. So we're using Zoom right now. Zoom theoretically could be a Sabita for all of our agencies, but it depends on how that contract, how we pay for Zoom. Uh, as we talked about earlier, Microsoft Office could be one, depends on how we pay for it. Um, but really getting into it, it depends on how the contract is set up. So if you have a contract and that contract is set up so that you're going to pay for the next three years for the right to use Zoom and you pay for it up front and you pay for 100 licenses and you say, all right, for the next three years, I have Zoom for 100 people in my agency. That would qualify as Sabita. Um, that, is, that is textbook. You have a software you um, or have a lease for three years, it's greater than a year, so it qualifies all of that. Um, the question that we're getting here is what's the renewal process and what is the, how does that affect our terms? So going back to Zoom, if you have Zoom and you only pay for it for a year and then next year comes around and you can pay for it for another year, you can pay for it another year, you intend to have Zoom for the next 30 years. Well, the contract that you've signed for Zoom, you're only required to use it for a year. And after a year ends, come next year, you can decide you hate Zoom, that it's no longer supported. You can decide that you're going to Teams now, decide that you're going back to Zoom, who knows. Um, but the contract that you've signed, your agency is liable only for that one year. You're not liable for another year. In that case, regardless of intent, that would be a short-term lease. It's only a 12-month lease. Where it gets a little hairy, and Gatsby 96 goes into detail on this, and I think this applies more to fixed assets, to, to like lease, like backhoes and equipment that would fall under Gatsby 96, but there are some much larger softwares that might, this might apply to. It's not going to be your Zooms and your Adobes. It's where you have a contract that says that you'll implement this software, and you will use it, you'll pay for a subscription for a year, but in the contract itself, itself, it says that you have the option to renew for the next five years at this price and that the vendor is, live, is responsible for giving that to you. So that is the situation where you need to look at intent. So you sign a contract for one year, but in the contract itself, it says that you can renew for five years at a certain price, at certain um, contractual obligations or whatever like that. If in that contract, you can leave after a year, but the vendor is stuck in that contract for the next five years based on whether or not you decide, that's when you need to look at intent. Does your agency intend to continue to renew that for the full term of what that contract exists? It, it really comes down to what the contract says and what's in writing and what options you have in writing. If there's no contract out there that gives you the option to continue renewing, it's just a pure of we like the software, we're probably gonna re-up it again. That's where this doesn't apply. Um, but like I was saying, the big softwares that you might have, um, like long-term custom softwares that you might have for health agencies or um, social, um, for tracking customers, that kind of thing, for tracking taxpayers, those are the things where you might need to look into this because you might have long-term contracts that have options to renew, to continue that relationship with the vendor. Um, that's where it gets a little hairy. Does that, does that make sense to y'all's questions? Yes. Um, if I can pop in real quick, one thing that is not considerable, considered a cancelable 
um, clause is funding. So just because you have in your um, contract that says this lease can be canceled if there is some sort of government funding um, shortage, that GASB 96 has a specific line item that says that does not uh, qualify as a cancelable lease. So just make sure y'all understand that. Yeah, the only time that would work is if you actually do, you you are confident that you do plan to cancel that subscription because of that. So if if you if y'all don't plan on canceling the subscription, it's just in the contract as an out. That that doesn't shorten the contract term to less than a year. But if you think that oh we're not going to have budget next year, we are not going to renew this subscription because of it, that's the only case where that term would actually apply. Um, Y'all had the question on uh, the prepaid closing package. Um, once again, let us get back to you on that. Um, we're still thinking through that, with what that accounting is going to be, whether or not those submittals that um, meet the capitalization threshold, if the prepaids would actually need to be reported on the prepaid closing package or not. Um, question on subscription-based software for access to case studies for attorneys. Um, that would more than likely qualify as a bit of that type of software does not exempt it. You'd have to look at the contract itself, but um, a cloud-based informational system like um, LexisNexis or anything like that would more than likely qualify um, just because you're paying, you're paying a subscription um, and you're paying a subscription for software. Um, it's not a person providing you services. It is a software that's giving you the access to the information you need. So the um, example that, if I can butt in real quick, the example yeah. on the website of that, the video that we posted on the website um, a couple days ago, where we give a real life example of the contract that we go um, soup to nuts, examining the contract and then doing a full implementation and set up the asset. That is an actual um, database software for um, legal, like legal, uh, whatever. Um, so it would be something that attorneys would use. Like Westlaw? Well, I don't want to reveal the, um, the vendor because uh, there was a, uh, there was a uh, confidentiality clause in um, the contract, but it was something that attorneys would use for um, for research. But if we use Westlaw, but we do not have a, a contract. You're a robot, Patrick. We can't hear you. Uh, a robot. Interesting. Yeah. No, your voice just got real mechanical sounding. Better now? Yes. So if we use, uh, if our agency uses like Westlaw or something like that, but we do not have a contract for it, uh, it's just a non submitter Are y'all paying monthly for it? Is that what you mean? Or you just pay mm -hmm. annually or? Maybe monthly or maybe annually, or I don't even know. I haven't looked into it. I know we pay them for something. Um, well, right. Patrick, what kind of question is that? <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to stump you guys. <laughs> yeah, you, you have don't to look know. for. Yeah, you'd have to look for how often you pay them and how long that okay. subscription lasts. So, if y'all are just paying a monthly for access, that would be a, a short-term submitter that would not qualify under the under 96 you would you would keep treating it the same as you always have if it's something that you're paying for and you're gaining access for more than a year that's when it would qualify excellent i'm, I'm just trying to add you know some some, some, some more color. real life and, yeah. and real life kind of things absolutely uh next and, question i see is sorry james, james if i can interrupt you and that's where we're running into a challenge of 
um, we get the invoices, but we don't necessarily ever see an agreement. And so finding out if, the, if one even exists or not is um, quite challenging within our agency and I'm sure within others too. Yeah. Um, so um, that's, that's one of the challenges that we're facing. Well, and if that's the case, Denise, then it may, it may be that you just document that you believe these are month to month. Um, you know, at the end yeah. of the day, you can only do what you can do. Um, yeah. But I do but, think I mean, it's... That ahead. gives you a list also to ask your IT crew of if they, they know those relationships, perhaps that they, they know them better than y'all do. Um, at the right. end of the in, in this case, it wouldn't be our IT crew. It would be our attorneys because the IT is not even involved in that whole situation with the yeah. attorneys. So. At the end of the day, really what's going to happen is your agency is going to have to be able to potentially prove to the auditors that you did an extensive list or, or a reasonable search for Sabitas and that you examined uh, for Sabitas. So you're going to have to be able to, to prove that you did uh, a reasonable search. And that, that I think is your answer, the answer to your question, Carrie, um, of whether you need an evaluation documentation. Um, we would recommend having all of your information saved in one place, showing what your process was for researching um, all of your software subscription, whether or not they followed under um, Jasmine 96 or not. So um, I would recommend doing something very similar to what you did for 87 um, so that when the auditors do come, you can show that you've, you've done your due diligence there. And we do not need to see that, that we are not part of that process. The only process we serve is to help educate you guys and help um, get the assets set up for the um, year-end financial statement. So what you guys, so the actual accounting process, that is that is in within your wheelhouse. So um, if you have questions, please, you know, we, we would love to answer that. But when you submit your year and packages, you do not need to give us your contracts. You do not need to give us um, all your accounting uh, stuff. I just want to make sure the CG's office is not your accounting department. So um, just make sure whatever you don't need, to, you don't need to go through that extra step of making sure we sign off on your accounting decisions. Just make sure y'all are taking a good look and have a good process um, in place for your auditors. Speaking of auditors, do the state auditors, um, would, are they able to give guidance or anything like that as of right now, or are they still working up what they're going to look at and how they want to see it and all of that? They are, um, we are, from what I understand, they are coming up and talking with Kelly um, weekly about GASB 87, um, particularly around the agencies that are having a lot of journal entries or the agencies that are slow in getting their packages in. Um, I know at this point we have 16 agencies that have yet to turn in their packages, um, and that is um, very troubling for those agencies um, because the auditors are aware of it. So um, GASB 97 is something that uh, I would take very seriously um, for your agencies because the thought process here is um, whether or not it's fair or not, because um, this is a very quick turnaround. The thought process is, and y'all please, this is not, please don't consider this is as, as any kind of ding on y'all. The thought process is there should be, there should be staff in place that should be able to handle this. There should be records in place that y'all should be able to, to do this. Um, now I, you know, I, there, I understand there's a whole, there's a whole slew of problems out there with hiring and getting people, you know, and paying people and getting good staff in there. So, you know, I'm not even going to scratch the surface on that, but, um, the implications are that, that the accounting department at, it should be able to implement GASB 87 and GASB 96. Um, so I don't know what, um, the auditors are going to do, but I can tell you that they have been up and at our, on our floor and have been asking questions about which agencies are struggling. So how that translates, I don't know. 
Um, I do see a question uh, about uh, if DTO purchases and provides software to agency. Um, that's going to be the case for a lot of agencies, I think, for a lot of the common software, Adobe, Word, all that kind of thing. Uh, in those situations, if you have software that you find that is provided to you by DTO, you'll pay DTO. Um, or another situation where you might pay a different agency. We had some of that with legislative agencies. Um, if what y'all would do, we're asking that y'all would fill out the implementation file and have a line item for that. But all you need to fill out is basically just the software description. And then there is a column that asks the question if it's from a different agency like DTO and you would put yes there. And then there's a column that says notes. And in the notes just say the agency that you get that from. And the reason we're asking for you to do that that will not be a submitter that y'all have to capitalize. That won't be on y'all's books. If, it, if you're getting it for another agency, it would be on that other agency's books. We're just asking that y'all include those in your implementation files simply so that we know what we're looking for when we look at their list. Um, so if y'all get anything from DTO, include it as a line item on your implementation file. Just fill out the name, um, the software description that yes, you get it from a different agency and just put DTO in that notes column. Um, and you don't have to do anything else for that line item, just give it to us so that we know that when we look at DTO, we look at admin, that we should be looking for that software um, specifically. There and in the third video I posted on the website, which is the example of the contract to implementation. Um, if you fall into this category, if you go to almost exactly minute 14, um, I address this head on and show you exactly how to do this. So um, that is just a quick and easy, uh, if you want to go, go look at that. As a small agency, as Denise again, as a small agency, I would tell you that my implementation list just grew with this last item we've discussed. But it's easy, Denise, it's easy. <laughs> Literally, it, literally, it's two items. And if you have like Microsoft Office Suite, you don't need to list out Excel. You don't need to list out PowerPoint. You can just put Microsoft Office Suite. And, and the purpose for that as well is just so that you'll have documentation for the auditors just to show that y'all thought about it. Yes. it. It didn't, you know, go past y'all that, that that existed. You're just writing that office saying, yes, this is our software. It's provided by DTO. Um, it's DTO's problem. Um, and then we'll, we will look for uh, DTO to tell us how their, that contract works on their side. And I would also like to say there, we have found that there are some instances where software is provided by an agency that is not DTO or Department of Administration, um, but another agency is subcontracting from from one agency is subcontracting from another agency. If that is the, and it, so it's not necessarily DTO or department administration. If that's the case, just put in the notes section, which agency it is. Somewhat similar question, Christina Jordan, you had a question about whether it's from a quasi agency, like a university. Um, we might need to discuss that in detail with you just so we have a better understanding of that situation. Yeah. There um, yeah, there's a, there, there are questions on that um, implementation file, which I'm going to go share my screen again. Um, if I can get there. Um, where uh, I believe you have to ask, there's a belts and suspenders approach to this implementation file where one, we ask you to kind of get familiar with what a submit is first then you're going to put it in on this file, but then you're going to have to answer a couple questions, um, which if you answer them in a certain way, will tell you whether or not they are Sabita. And one of them is um, right here. It, column B is a software subscription with a blended component unit, such as a college. And if you answer that here, uh, just mar you'll mark it there. Yeah, we'll have to look at that in detail, I think, to get to the a full understanding of how that works. Um, any questions that I missed or anything else? 
Yes, I have a question. Um, so we have one group that is an audited financial statement entity instead of under the ACFR. Um, is this something that they need to be looking at as an audited financial statement entity? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, if, if, they, if they report under GASB, then they will have to be reporting it. I'm sure that their auditors or whoever they do their financial statements with have probably already talking with them about it. Nope, they haven't said anything to them. That's why I'm asking this question so we can they, try they to should, get ahead of it. Raise it then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they it, should it, know. It, it, yeah, and you know what, they're, Denise, they are free to, they're free to use any of our materials or come in on these calls. I know um, Abby Sellers from, um, I, I, it's not Department insurance. of Insurance, but um, Insurance Reserve Fund, Absolutely. maybe. I've, I've, asked, yeah. I've invited her to come on, on these um, calls, just uh, even though she's an AFS agency. Um, if there's not any more questions, I want to show you something on this GASB basic overview communications final. This is um, the guide that we put out. Real quick, though. Oh, yeah. Um, just for the person who has the um, audited financial statements, keep in mind, it is not the 2022 financial statements. It's the 2023 financial statements but you need to get everything going now. So the, your auditors might not have asked you about it, but you've got to be weary of, you've got to get going on it. Thank you, David. Yep. So um, one thing that's on this guide, um, which depending on how you guys learn, some people are visual learners and some people like to read. I don't like, to um, read, especially, especially just uh, long, um, just, just absolutely filthy uh, accounting standards uh, discussions. Um, so you might not have looked at this guide, but um, there is a section of this guide that I think is great. And it talks about SBITA qualifications and they walk through a series of questions that you can ask about SBITA. Um, it is on page seven. And um, this, it just really, I think, um, within about maybe maybe a half a page boils down a lot of the Sabita um, qualifications where it, it asks a series of questions like, will this software no longer work? Will we no longer be able to log in once the contract term ends? If your answer is yes, we will not be able to answer, <laughs> excuse me, we will not be able to access the software at the end of the contract it is likely that a SBITA exists. So then we move on to the next question. Does the contract provide the agency the right to use the IT software? If the answer is yes, it is likely that a SBITA exists. Um, this is kind of a nuanced question here. Um, James, I think we, James and I went back, right, back and forth here and discussed it and we put an analogy here. And basically what this is getting to is, does your agency have full, um, right to the software to use however they want to use or not use to put an employee in it to hire a contractor to use it to put their dog to use this software I mean however they want to use the software um, do can they use the software however they want and then qu question three is the maximum maximum contractual term of our contract including any contractually bound options to extend 12 months or less um, and then, you know, if you can go through those questions with your, your software, uh, you've pretty much got a Sabita on your hands. So, um, I think that's a good, a good starting point for looking at your software contracts. And Carrie, your question, um, the, the question on updates, I don't think, um, whether you get updates or not wouldn't matter for a submit. The question is whether or not you have access to it. Um, so if it's a software that um, that you purchase up front and then y'all have y'all can use it for forever, there's no term where it would end. That would not be a submit. But if it's a, it, we're looking for a subscription term. It, there has to be a fixed term where you have access to it. And once that term ends, once that contract is over, you no longer have access to it. The, the, the analogy we use and what Catherine was just showing was when you're renting a backhoe. So you go to a company, you rent a backhoe, 
you now have access to that backhoe. You can do with whatever you want, but once that term is over, you've got to return that backhoe to someone. So once you've your term for that software is over, you no longer have access to that software, you can't use it anymore. So going back to Zoom, you pay for Zoom for three years. At the end of that three years, you can't use Zoom anymore. Um, that's the idea. You might get updates throughout it as they're giving you more up to date. They're, you know, keeping the software useful to you. Um, you might not, but the question is whether or not at the end of the term, can you still use that software or not? And if, yeah. if once the term's over, you still have it and you can still keep using it, then that's more than likely not a Sabita because it's a perpetual license. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's the questions you got to be asking for this. Right. And that's that question right here. Will this software no longer work? Will we no longer be able to log on once the contract term ends? Um, one thing I'd like to talk about, wait, is there another question that came in, James? That's, that's all I see. Okay. Um, one thing I'd like to talk about is it's kind of a, a sticky concept of variable versus fixed cost. James, would you mind talking about that? Uh, yes. Um, so the, the idea of what we capitalize when it comes to Sibita, um is what you, you know for a fact you're going to have to pay. So for the most part, when you pay for a software, you might pay for um, 100 people. I'll keep using Zoom. You pay for 100 people to have licenses for Zoom for the next three years. Um, but those would be fixed costs, and you would know that for the next three years, you have to pay X amount per month for Zoom. Or maybe you, maybe you might pay annually, but you get it for three years. You have to pay X amount for the next three years for those that software subscription contract. Well, it gets a little hairy when you get into the more complex softwares that might have more implementation to them. So say you have this big, huge software that um, you might need use for tracking taxpayers or tracking, tracking um, clients for your, your agency. And you pay a subscription to that company because it is cloud-based. And then you pay for 100 licenses. But the way the company has set up their contract is you pay 100 licenses and that's your base. And then going forward, if you need more, they might upcharge you. They might say that any, any person you need to add, any additional license you need to add over that 100 will charge you an extra dollar per month or something like that. That's where you get variable costs. Because you know for a fact that for the next three years, you're going to have to pay $1,000 per year for that base amount. But you might have to pay an extra dollar every month for if you hire an extra employee that needs that software. The next month, you might need less because they quit. You might need an extra 10 in a month after that. That's where the variable costs come in. If it, is a, if it is a cost that you do not know what it's going to be, it's not fixed in nature over the term of that subscription, that piece of that cost would not be capitalized. That would be expensed as a contingent. Um, I think that y'all use that for leases already. Um, the piece that is fixed in nature would be the part that would be um, pulled back as present value, capitalized as an asset and as a liability. And that's the part that you would pay off every month. The difference between the part that you pay as principal and interest, that piece that's variable, you would put to contingent. And that contingent is expensed immediately. And y'all, and y'all are, and this is exactly, <laughs> excuse me, this is exactly how you're doing it now with GASB 87. Um, so you should be familiar with this cost, uh, th this setup. Um, but just keep in mind for, with Sabita, um, I think this comes into account a lot with the, with the idea of seats um, or users, um, but fixed costs are what you are on the hook for contractually bound to pay regardless, uh, and that you can estimate sitting now in the future going forward, and that if nothing else changes, they could come and sue you for this, and that you would have to pay, if, if that makes sense. Um, fixed costs could also be indexed. So like with that contract example um, that I pulled up earlier, um, uh, this contract example, the fixed costs are increasing. Um, and then there's also in this contract, there's a clause in this contract, which I talk about on the video 
um, where the the contra the um, vendor talks about how they can come back in and do an audit, and based on the audit, they may have to raise prices depending on the the professional mix between lawyers and um, support staff, and if the um, if the agency's mix changes, they might change the the um, the rate here, and because that's built into the contract, maybe sometime in the future, depending on that audit, they might have to go back in and change the pricing structure and then thus change the um, asset um, price and the payment schedule, but that's already in the contract. Um, but as, when it comes to the variable costs, versus fixed costs, just make y'all make sure y'all are very clear on what that is so that when you set up your capitalization, you guys are right on the money on it. And then you can differentiate on your bill when you get it in and you can mark what is fixed and what is variable. And um, I'm going to go ahead and anticipate when y'all submit your bill to um, the CG's office. And I'm just I'm just spitballing here to make sure that you are clear on your bill for the CG's office of what's fixed versus what's variable to make it easy on them to approve. Or excuse me, let me make sure I use better, better term, terminology for them. What is, what would be uh, agreed to the general ledgers of um, um, the principal and interest and that would agree to your payment schedules and then what would have what would be coded to contingent and so you just want to make sure and then tie that back to your um, invoice and then again keep in mind taxes on all of this Okay, is there any other questions we have? Okay, so we are at an hour and 15 minutes. Anybody else? Oh, Shannon Fields, what you got? Nope, okay. Um, so I'm going to, as long as I did this record right, I'm going to Wait, taxes. If an out, if it is out of state vendor and does not bill tax, do we use tax? No. Uh, you just want you want it to agree to what you're going to pay. So this um, this just came in. So whatever the bill is, that's what is going to be paid. Which, um, for if, example, you guys are looking right now um, at my screen. Uh, here, this 12280 when I checked this bill, because this, this vendor is already being paid, um, when, I, when I set this up to be capitalized, I went ahead and checked to see if this 12280 how it was being posted in the general ledger, and it did not have taxes computed on it. So I felt confident that I could go ahead and capitalize it without imputing taxes on it. So I, does that answer your question? So Catherine, going back to the use tax question, uh -huh. if, it's, if it's an out-of-state vendor and they do not bill us use tax or tax and tax is applicable, we have to indicate that that payment is use tax applicable. And then later on the system's coming in for some and others, they're doing manual calculations to remit use tax, use tax. to the Department of Revenue. And that's what that question is about. Okay. Um, yes, that's correct. Yeah, so I'm sorry, uh, my apologies then, because this is getting outside of my wheelhouse. Um, I, then I would I would say if you know taxes are going to be paid on it, and and they just weren't paid at that point, then I would go ahead and impute taxes on it. Uh, James or David, you guys want to confirm for me? Um, one thing you also want to be mindful of is when you do your amortization schedule that your principal is paid uh, according to the schedule and that you are paying it to where your principal will go down to zero 
by the end, not into the negative, not some remnant, but it always goes to zero. So if it's taxed, that's fine, but you got to make sure it's separate from your principal and interest payments. Yeah, and I, I would say if you have out of state um, tax, I would handle it the same way you do 87. So if y'all usually use uh, calculate use tax when you capitalize leases that you're paying a vendor from outside out of state, um, then I would treat it the same. My gut reaction is for the most of these softwares, you probably won't have tax because I don't believe that software is taxed currently by DOR. I could be completely wrong, but um, my gut is that for a lot of these, you won't, but there might be some cases where you do. James uh, is a former tax um, CPA. So... Um, okay. Do we have any other questions? Shannon, here? Shannon had a question about okay. Microsoft. Um, I, we can't say for sure. It, it would come down to how your agency pays for it. Um, I know for, for Comptroller General, we pay DTO. So we're, we're not even aware of the specifics to, um, how our Microsoft works. Um, so it would come down to how long do you pay for it? What's the terms of that subscription? Is it for more than a year? Um, is that a perpetual license? Is it something that you have to renew? Um, so I, I, I can't speak to it specifically without any more detail. Yeah, Shannon, um, for that Microsoft Assurance, go to this GASB 96 guide um, and go to, I think it's page seven, uh, where we ask, we, we uh, tell you to go through these series of questions and ask yourself these questions about that Microsoft Assurance. Um, and that will give you the answer because really every single Sabita is like, um, if you have children, all your children are different. Um, and just because they all have maybe the same last name doesn't mean they're all going to be the same. So um, Microsoft Assurance in one agency might be a Sabita and Microsoft Assurance at another agency might not. So um, you have to ask yourself this question every single time. These questions every single time. And I can't emphasize enough for you that that the CG's office cannot make cannot make these decisions for you as to what is a Sabita and what is not. And we cannot be setting up these assets for you. This, this is going to be falling onto your agency to making uh, to to be setting this up for you. So it is critical that y'all understand Sabitas and how to set them up, just like it was for GASB 87. But I'm hoping that having gone through GASB 87, y'all are familiar enough with the process that it should be relatively, relatively smooth. Yeah, from, from a practical perspective, once you know what you have, the accounting is the exact same. You'll exactly. set up an asset, you'll pay it. Um, when it comes through by um, hitting principal and interest, you'll depreciate the asset. It, it's the same accounting treatment. It's just, you've got to figure out what exists. Where 87, you knew what leases you had. This is a, a new category that we haven't really had focus on before. So that's, that's, where, the, that's where the wrinkle comes in. We get a second question here. Department is from Lori Dean. Okay, so um, she asked the Department of Education contracts may include the governor's school, which are supposed to be independent as of 7 1, 2022. Should we include those contracts? Um, yes, I would right now because they're under your agency and this is due on uh, June. 10th so well i i would i would include them just for informational at this point but i'll definitely put it in the notes because if they are independent as of 7-1 they won't fall under our purview so that we will not be capitalizing these assets until 7-1 2022 and the amounts that we're looking for is anything that exists as of 7-1 going forward um so if they are separate from the state as of that date um, we may not need them. Let's discuss that with you, Lori. Yeah. yeah. Okay, James. I wanted to just tell you they're going. They'll be. They will be becoming independent state agencies. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. 
So they, yeah, they're just going to be moved. reported. Yeah, they, they okay. won't be reported. They're not, they're not an AFS. They're going to be still be a separate agency. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. You need to go ahead and report them um, as of 610-2022 because okay. um, you're still responsible for them. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lori. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. I wish I could. I wish I could give you a, a give you a bone on this one, but no. Gotcha. That's okay. I understood. All uh -huh. right, I'll do it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. You won't have to reconcile them starting on Ju uh, July first. So there you go. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs>